Hi. Hi. It's so nice well, to finally get to see your face. I know. Nice to virtually meet you. Yeah, you too. Is that a Christmas decoration in the background? It's my tree. Oh, I love it. I've already put my stuff up too. I'm not judging. I feel like everyone should. We just need a little bit happy. Yeah. How's your day going so far? Oh, pretty good. Yeah, I can't complain. What about you? It's going. It's been a really busy day, but I'm looking forward to this webinar. Yeah, me too. Yeah, feel free if you have stuff to do. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to make sure that everything was working because I've had an oopsie before, so I don't want that to happen no. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad you got on early because actually this is like my first web too, so... Hopefully nothing goes wrong. Got a dog going on in the background. I'm like, maybe I'll put my headphones in. Okay. Cute. There we go. Hello, welcome. Hey, it's Tim Conway, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, thank you. Thanks Am I the first one in? Tim? You bet, thanks for having second. me. <laughs> You're the hey, second Tim. one. Hi, Angelica. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, it's nice to meet you. Good to meet you as well, what do you do? Um, I'm the Director of Sustainability for Advantis Engineers, so I do sustainability consulting. Okay, right and, on. And you're with Shaw, is that right? Yeah, I manage the sustainability initiatives for Shaw on the oh. commercial divisions, uh, flooring manufacturer. And are you here in Pittsburgh? I am in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, My company's Columbus. in North Georgia. Yeah, but I'm I'm in Columbus. Great. I love that they have you up here doing that job. That's that's fun. Well, listen, I uh, I grew up in Columbus, and then I grew up professionally in Portland, Oregon. And when this job opened up. Uh, I'm like, hey, I uh, really don't care to live in Georgia. So it was good. You know, my wife and I miss uh, the West Coast, but it was a good opportunity to get back home. And uh, it's good to be from the middle, right? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I'm just noticing that mine doesn't actually say my name. So I'm Ashley. I'm the Pittsburgh City Center Director for IIDA. <laughs> hey, Ashley, how are you? Great. How are you? Good. I'm doing wonderful. I'm glad that you're here. Do we have a uh, good attendance? Will everybody, so I see it's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. Will mm -hmm. this be very uh, Pittsburgh centric? Will it will be all those different markets? Uh, I believe it's, it's pretty Pittsburgh centric. I know we have some support um, from other people in the chapter hopping on, but I think it's mostly Pittsburgh. Okay. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Angelica. Not a full week unless I'm in like a half dozen meetings together. Somehow. Yeah, but we haven't. Oh, no, we did. I've heard tried to block that meeting out on Monday. But yes, we were already on a call together this week. <laughs> yeah. Ashley, it's nice to meet you. Hey, um, nice from our conversation you, that we had, you've come up with some really good questions here. These, uh, these, uh, the, the questions that you sent out. Thank you. I had some help from Google, but. <laughs> <laughs> Google the sustainability team or Google the search engine? Google the search engine. Yes. Yeah. 
Hey, Mark, yeah. Tim Conway, nice to meet you. Hi, Tim, you too. And you're with, again? Shaw Industries, a flooring Shaw. manufacturer. Yeah, oh, and tell me what you do, Mark. Uh, I'm with Evolve, we're a green building and sustainability consulting and design firm. Okay. We're located in Pittsburgh. Hi, Heather. Hi, Brenna. Hey, Tim. Hi, Brenna. Nice. Hey, Heather, what's going on? <laughs> Not much. I'm going to question you guys. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, what, what's the format, by the way? So uh, Heather and I are just gonna take turns asking you guys uh, the questions and um, we can kind of just let it flow. I'll start with um, each one of you and then we'll go from there. Uh, we have an hour and a half. I don't think we're gonna use the whole entire hour and a half, um, but very casual. Well, Ashley, based on your questions, I could go an hour and a half on the first three. I won't. But Great. again, but again, really, really good questions. Uh, it made me uh, uh, do a deep dive. So thank you for. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, seriously. And I, and I think very, very relevant to IIDA. So uh, I, I think it's really good. Well, thank you so much. Well, on that note, then we'll we'll try to keep um, each answer. Um, within the time frame, I guess within the limit. Um, and we'll just go from there. So without further ado for, let's see how many people we actually have. Are you gonna open here. it up to questions and answers from the audience as well? Yes, we can do that. So we'll leave some time at the end and we'll do some Q and A because I'm sure, like you said, these are some pretty in-depth questions. So people will definitely have some questions too. So uh, bear with me. This is my very first webinar as the new Pitt City Center Director. So not very familiar, but I'll do my best. Um, we've got about 13 participants, which isn't that bad. I think we had about 20 signed up, so we can go ahead and get started. So thank you guys all for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time this evening to talk with me and um, me and Heather. So this is the NEWH IIDA Pittsburgh Sustainability Roundtable 2020. Obviously it's virtual because of we are in COVID time. So, <laughs> so Heather is actually uh, the NEWH Programming Director for the Pittsburgh chapter. And like I said, she's gonna be my fellow moderator. Um, for our opening statement here, um, I wanted to start by saying that sustainability is defined by seeking the well-being of current and future generations with the limit of the natural world balancing the ways in which short-term interests at the individual and organize, organizational levels enhance or are at odds with those of global systems and communities in the longer term. Sustainability is no longer just a topic, but an important deal that communities across the country are embracing. Reducing our impact on the environment becomes more pressing every passing day. Our panel has come together today to talk about the integration of sustainable best practices and how our design community can come together and make a difference. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to introduce each of our panelists real quick. Um, Angelica Serrani, she's the Director of Sustainability with Advantis Engineers, and she assists with design and operation and creating and maintaining healthy and high-performing buildings and communities. So thanks for joining us. Mark Mondor is the Principal at Evolve EA and is also the AIA Pennsylvania President. Um, Mark has been an influential voice in sustainability since the early 1990s. Mark sees triple bottom line potential in every project and focuses on green design and construction practices in order to leverage organizational and operational sustainability. Tim Conway is coming to us from Shaw Industries. He's the Vice President of Sustainability. Tim has changed company, the company's attitude towards sustainability, namely that his goal is to make sure that everybody knows it's a collective responsibility. Tim is focused on the positive effects that sustainable flooring products have on our buildings and more importantly, the people that occupy, occupy the spaces that we design. And then we have Brenna Schaefer, who's an associate with Rothschild Doino Collaborative. She's leading the advancement of integrated sustainable design and development strategies that balance a human centric focus with a goal of uh, the built environment. She's an advocate for a transdisciplinary approach that leverages the evidence-based design to empower and enhance stewardship of the environment. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. 
And I'm gonna start us off with the first question and I'll direct this towards you, Angelica. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Um, I mentioned where you work, but you can again say that and how you really became involved with sustainability throughout your career. Sure, absolutely. And thanks so much for, for having me here today. And um, I'm excited to be you know, joining the rest of these great panelists too. So um, as you mentioned, my role is the Director of Sustainability at Advantis Engineers. And in this role, you know, I serve clients on sustainability projects. Um, our firm is also very heavily involved in commissioning of buildings and that's kind of how we got our start. Um, prior to joining Advantis about a year ago, I was the director of the Pittsburgh 2030 district, which is an initiative where about 750 buildings in Pittsburgh have committed to aggressive environmental goals. Um, and that was at Green Building Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization here in Pittsburgh. And then before that, I, uh, I managed sustainability in the green building program for PNC Bank. Um, and prior to that at the Sports and Exhibition Authority at the Convention Center and Sports Stadium. So, um, you know, my background is in civil engineering, but I've always um, had a focus on sustainability and a long history of that here in the Pittsburgh region. That's awesome, thank you so much. Tim, can you tell me a little bit about your background, more about what you work and how you became more involved with sustainability? Yeah, so thank you for having me, Pittsburgh and Ashley, I appreciate it. So I've been with Shaw for 25 years. I uh, graduated from Ohio State. I got this job out of college. And then I grew up professionally with Shaw in Portland, Oregon. It's safe to say that 25 years ago that the VP of sustainability was not a position at my company or any position, right? So I found myself in Portland, Oregon, right as USGBC and LEED became something. And I got addicted to it, right? I got addicted to it for... What, what I know now is all the right reasons. It was the same time that my company started to work with Bill McDonough in Cradle to Cradle. Mm -hmm. And since I've read that book, Cradle to Cradle, and Bill has been a mentor to me you know, since those early days, I've never looked at anything the same way in my personal life or my professional life. So I got addicted to lead, not because of what it did for buildings, but what my product and flooring contributed. I thought of recycled content more about landfill consumption I thought of recycled content more about natural resource depletion. And once you know something, you can't unknow it. So I think that I was at the right place in the right time working for the right company. So when the uh, sustainability position to open at Shaw, I, I was there to fill it. Um, so I really feel fortunate that I am in a position where my personal values and my professional values are in alignment. And I think that's not just an opportunity for for Mark and for Angelica and for Brenna, I think it's for an opportunity for all of us in this industry as, look, as we look at what we do through this lens of sustainability. So uh, accidentally, uh, I've gotten into this position just by uh, being at the right place at the right time. That's awesome. Thanks, Tim. Mark, can you tell me about your background, a little bit more about where you work and how you became involved with sustainability? Uh, sure. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. I, I really appreciate this, this opportunity to, to, to chat. Absolutely. Um, you know, for, uh, I, uh, you know, I started out in, in engineering and uh, then went to architecture school in, in, um, uh, in, in, at Cal Poly in California. And um, it, I, I wasn't thinking of this, but, but Tim just said something that, that triggered something within me, which is um, probably in the late 80s or so, one of the uh, professors said half the jobs that will exist in the year 2000 don't exist yet. And certainly there was nothing about a green building consulting, much less being able to, to make a, a living doing it. So, um, you know, coming out of, of uh, architecture school and, and I'd, I'd you know, done my best to study sustainability, you know, whatever that meant at, back in those days. Uh, but uh, my formation was really as, a, as an architect, but really volunteering a lot on uh, sustainability and green building efforts. Back then, the only thing was really the, in Pittsburgh, a group called CCI. And there was this volunteer group called the Green Building Alliance that was really just a half dozen of us. I mean, it, it was just a, a bunch of volunteers that you know, were well-meaning. And, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's taken off in the national sphere since then. So the point being is that by, by following that sort of sustainability ethic as an architect, I, I was always trying to find opportunities 
so the, the market kind of evolved to where there was a, a desire and a need for people who could bring sustainability expertise in, into projects. And so, um, you know, uh, early on, uh, I was able to, to get a job as a green building consultant for a nonprofit, uh, the Green Building Alliance, actually, um, enough to prove that the concept existed and the proof of concept, and then enough to kind of um, have that be taken away from the nonprofit sphere because already it was a, uh, a market-based solution that uh, the nonprofit had no business doing. So within just a few short years, uh, green building and sustainability consulting became something uh, really relevant. Uh, and so therefore, uh, right around that time, I, I, um, my, my wife and partner and I uh, became uh, you know, launched Evolve in, in uh, 2004, specifically as a triple bottom line firm doing nothing but sustainability. So you know, back in those days, uh, that wasn't all that common, but, but it's, it's been a, a, you know, a, a road in that we've been working with buildings, uh, the design and the construction of buildings, then the operations and maintenance of buildings, then the uh, initial uh, planning and, and uh, strategy for organizational sustainability, goal setting, facilitation, community planning, lead projects, um, eco districts, uh, faculty teaching about lead. So the, the entire movement has really broadened out um, to where, like Tim said, it's, it's not even recognizable to how it was 25 years ago, which, which is great. So doing that in practice, but also um, uh, ev involved with the American Institute of Architects, where we're able to create a committee in the environment in Pittsburgh, then create a committee the, in the environment uh, for the environment in Pennsylvania. And now I'm president of, of uh, AI Pennsylvania, which has 3,000 members pushing for uh, climate change legislation and uh, net zero actions um, you know, across the Commonwealth. And also lastly, uh, working on the um, uh, uh, climate action plan for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I serve as vice chair of the Climate Change Advisory Committee. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Brenna, last but last, not least, can you tell me a little bit about your background, a little bit more about where you work and how you became involved with sustainability? Sure, so um, I'll echo everyone else. Thanks for organizing this and um, I'm humbled to be part of this great group. Um, so I have a really kind of circuitous path coming to sustainability, um, much less straightforward and noble than everyone else on this panel, I'd say. Um, so I, you know, going back to, to my time in, in school, um, in college, I had a really strong focus on equity, uh, social and racial equity in particular. And um, I really intentionally focused a lot of my schoolwork on those things. So um, working in Lame Deer, Montana on the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation with the American Indian Housing Initiative, um, doing some work in the slums of Panama City, um, going to Corral in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh to do some work um, there as well in grad school. So I had really cultivated this, this set of priorities about you know, where I wanted my career to go. Um, I don't know about anyone else, I graduated into the Great Recession. Um, and so I, I landed at a really um, wonderful global firm um, doing really fantastic work. I worked on a lot of super talls um, globally. Um, so uh, buildings about a, a, a thousand feet. <laughs> um, and uh, it was great, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, a really high level of, of design exploration and complexity. Um, but also knowing in the back of my mind that when we built a new city, it was on a green field. And when we were putting up a new tower, we were displacing historic hutongs in Shanghai, China. Um, and that there was always this really um, evident trade-off um, that we minimized by going after these rating systems. And it was this little, you know, this, um, it was very much a process in conflict. Um, so a few years ago, when I moved back to Pittsburgh, I decided that it was time to um, refocus my career on uh, all of those things that I think are at the core of my moral fiber and um, what I believe architecture has the potential to achieve in all of our communities. 
Um, and so really, you know, I, I'm trying to, as best I can, undo any bad that I've done as an architect and hopefully work toward a regenerative future um, that hopefully has a positive impact is my legacy. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, so my work right now at Rothschild Doino Collaborative is really exciting. Um, we're looking to sustainability, um, not just in the environment, um, but putting people first and putting that as at the forefront of our practice and as the backbone of every single project that we take on, uh, big and small. So it's a really exciting time to be refocusing on this. And, um, and yeah, so that's kind of the, the ping-ponging back and forth about how I ended up where I am. Thank you, Brenna. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this over to Heather. She's going to read the second question for you guys. All right. Um, what time scales do and should designers consider? For example, there is a behavioral challenge when it comes to time scales required for sustainability. Daily tasks tend to take precedence over the future and the payoff is more long term. How could you overcome that hurdle when talking to clients? And I'll let Tim go first this time, just so Angelica doesn't have to go first every time. <laughs> We're not going alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I took some notes, and then after hearing everybody else talk, I've changed everything. <laughs> so in that question, I heard, what about time scales? What about behavior change? And how do you talk about clients? Those are three things I heard about this. When I think about time scales, I think about the work that we're doing, right? And what we're trying to do is gonna take forever. So I'm glad we've gotten started. So I challenge our people, when are you gonna start? Right? When are you as a, a rep for our company gonna start to talk about something else and what it looks like, what it costs and all these other things? As a designer, when are we going to start? Right, because this forever sometimes seems like it's getting shorter. And Bernie, you're right. We've got a lot of challenges in front of us. We have climate change, social equity. We have chemicals of concern. We are in a position that we can make some impacts to these things, but we have to determine what our time scale is and when are we going to get started, right? And I think that's the opportunity that we have. But this, in, in the other part of the question, this is, is this a behavior change? Absolutely, it's a behavior change. But I think that we've come so far as an industry, right? Whether it be manufacturers, architects, design professionals, owners. I think we've been to the moon and back several times and still have a long way to go. But when it comes to behavior change, I really think that we get the word hard confused with the word different. And can we start to change the way we communicate differently with manufacturers? Change the way we communicate about what true, you know, if we've designed ourselves into this mess in the built environment, can we design ourselves out of this? And it changes with that. Be that's the behavior change. That's the starting line. And I think everybody's asking us, like, is this, you know, how do I have this conversation with a client? And I hear this a lot, like from design professionals all over the country. I hear from our sales reps, hey, I really want to talk about sustainability, but the client didn't ask for it. But the client asked for you to be innovative. The client asked for you to design something beautiful, something this. And I don't think that anybody woke up today and said, I want to go do the wrong thing. So I think I used we, to do that. <laughs> but can, 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 but, but can, we, can we start to talk about the design intent, not just from the bottom line, like what's the ROI? Can we start talking about design intent from the storyline? Like here's a beautiful palette of the selections that we've made. And if you told a different story to this, which client would say, that's terrible, I don't want that type of product. But if you said, here's products that were made in a carbon neutral manufacturing facility, have no chemicals of concern as identified by the material red list, have 44% recycled content, and have the ability to be recycled at the end of their time of service. Can we talk about outcomes? And can we storyline design? Is this, is this something that we could you know, move from this is too hard to just a different way that we define what we do together. And I think if we start talking about design intent to the outcomes of what we do, clients are gonna buy in. I think people in your firm are gonna buy in. And I think that starting line 
is going to get a lot easier and we're going to move a lot faster together. So those are the things I, I heard in that question. Uh, and I would love to hear uh, from my friends on the panel about their thoughts. Uh, let's go to you, Mark. Um, certainly. Um, yeah, the, the way I interpret the, the question um, uh, in, in speaking to clients about potential alternatives to conventional and conventional is the way that a, a project might be delivered uh, using rules of thumb and how it's usually done, and this is how we do it. Um, what um, what we're when we talk about something being green, we're talking about being more ecologically beneficial than conventional. So often our, our role is to pr propose green or sustainable alternatives, and, and often those do cost more money up front. If you're talking about photovoltaic panels, if you're talking about a slight premium for something that's um, sustainably harvested or so compared to conventional, compared to the cheapest way that you could get it now. So when you're looking at those types of comparisons, there is a premium and, and the challenge, which your, your question really hits at, is that a client typically wants to have a, a, a quick return on that investment. If they're going to pay that extra premium, they wanna make sure they get it back quickly. After all, they might be selling the building in a few years or, or, or whatnot. Uh, sometimes you, you'll have, uh, you know, uh, higher ed or, or, or K through 12 or municipal where it's a multi-decade long project cycle and they don't mind taking 30, 40, 50 years uh, to um, have their return on investment. But often it's much faster than that and, and it, it really it puts an onus on us if we're proposing it in order to, to try to come up with a return on investment. So. The return on investment financially would be typically around energy savings or something like that. So if something costs more now, but it's gonna save you energy and operating costs over a certain amount of time, and it takes four years to recoup that, then that's a four year ROI and that's generally acceptable. So you, you take a look at it that way with regards to, to, uh, to, to financial ROI. That's the way our brains are wired anyway. We think about money and finance. And if you look on the news, it's always about how did the stock market do and so forth. But in sustainability, it's not just about finance. It's about triple bottom line. You're also looking at what's good for people and what's good for the environment. So you can very well take other values other than money and the metrics that are associated with money, which might be lease rate, which might be cost per square foot, which might be uh, um, you know, um, uh, in incremental cost. And you can apply the values to other things you could be looking at, such as air quality, uh, uh, awareness, uh, mental acuity within spaces, uh, the ability to sleep well, or the ability uh, to, to um, you know, uh, have a lower heart rate or something like that. Or on the uh, environmental side, it could be the, the amount of oxygen that you're giving off, or, or like Tim was referring to, products that have no carbon impact or, or um, um, things of that nature. So you could be looking at all of these different things and whichever ones you decide to prioritize, they also can have an ROI. So the idea of having an ROI is not just financial. If you're talking about making a better environment for, for people, employees or, or students or, or um, uh, hospital patients, then you can have a faster discharge rate for hospitals, you can have higher test scores for schools, you can hire, have higher retention rates for, for offices. And if you're looking at it that way, then suddenly all the different things that pencil out and make your argument are, are, are much more significant than just the pure savings on energy or, or what have you. So the way we tend to look at this in, in order to answer your question is the longer the ROI is allowable, the better. Because if, if hard-headed clients want an immediate ROI, it's very hard to figure anything out that, that's going to resonate with them. But like Tim says, if you're looking at the larger issues and longer time cycles and what, what is really important and how do you want for this project to be in 20, 40 years? Do you want this project to be loved and a part of the community? Then you can actually try a lot more things because then you, you, you've, you've got a longer time horizon with which you can actually have your, the returns on the different things you're prioritizing. Thank you very much. And Brenna, um, do you have a little to say about this? I'm sure you've run into this with some of your clients. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I would echo everything that, uh, that, you know, Mark and Tim have said specifically about um, ROI. The, the other thing is that um, it, I think in terms of time scale, it's at every single scale. It's both urgent and important. So it needs to be addressed, you know, today, tomorrow. And we also need to be thinking about those long-term uh, commitments that we're making and we're asking our clients to make um, in terms of these systems that do have a higher initial first cost and, um, and are going, they are going to take longer um, to see kind of the financial benefit if that's the primary model that they're referencing um, as you know, in their kind of cost benefit analysis. I think the really important thing is to meet every single client where they are and to help them to grow within this conversation in whatever capacity they have. Um, you know, we work with a lot of nonprofits. They don't have bottomless budgets. Um, so it's our jobs as, as designers not to just be creative in, um, in kind of the, the superficial details, but it's our responsibility to be very deeply creative, to think about all of those things that we're able to integrate to meet them where they are as a program, as an organization, where their budget is, um, the type of maintenance that they're going to have to be able to maintain any of these really complex systems over the, long, uh, over the life of the building. So we try and think at, at all scales and at all times. Um, we also recognize that it's not just our, uh, our job to deliver a building and then to walk away. It's our job to deliver a building that will last for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, and that they have the ability to maintain to a really high standard and that will continue to serve their needs. Um, you know, if we, if we deliver a building um, kind of at that bare minimum level, um, that meets the immediate programmatic and financial needs of a client, but they outgrow that system or it fails or you know, it's, it's antiquated after 15 years and they have to move or renovate. I mean, then we haven't done our job because the sheer fact that they have to go back in and take another look at that space negates any sort of sustainable, sustainable systems that we had put in from the outset because their shelf life has, has, um, has stopped essentially. So I think that, you know, in terms of time scale, we always think that um, it's about listening. It's about listening to what people are saying, but also what they're not saying and uh, trying to meet them exactly where they are and also project where they need to be. Um, so there's a little magic in it, but I think that it's something that um, as an industry, we're getting better and better uh, able to address. Um, we have greater fluency in it, and we're seeing greater market transformation across not just the building environment, um, but across everything. Um, you know, uh, beauty products, books, furniture. Um, it's become, you know, there's, a, there's some greenwashing. There's some, um, there is, uh, but I think that deep down, there is a very real desire and intent for people to make good decisions. Um, we just have to optimize the trade-offs for them. Yeah, so I, I, I will, of course, also just say that I agree with everything that my fellow panelists have said already. And one thing that really struck me is in something that I really believe in, in terms of like theory of change is about, you know, meeting people where they are, like setting, you know, setting very measurable goals, but not doing that until you are listening and understanding what people actually need from you. Um, you know, I, currently I'm on the consulting side of things, but for a long time I was on the owner side, you know, working with consultants. And one of the things that I found very frustrating in that process was people not maybe bringing me these ideas, like that I, because I was the sustainability champion was asking for them. And so, you know, that's certainly like a, a tension point that I see around like getting involved early in the design. When I think of time, like the first thing I'm thinking of is talk about sustainability on day one, the day that you've started thinking about the project, you have to be thinking about sustainability and about everything that that encompasses, because that's how you can really make an impact that also, you know, isn't going to affect the bottom line of the project um, in the same way. You know, I also think that these objectives that the clients are providing up front, you know, and kind of like working through that with them. And like Brenna was saying, like truly listening, um, you can always be pointing back to those as, you know, does this decision that I'm making today meet the intent of that goal that we set six months ago? So I think that that's a really critical part of any project. Um, I also think that 
uh, I think that I kind of got at this at the beginning, but I think that there's a lot of responsibility on people who are working as consultants to, to bring ideas to their clients because their clients, you know, are expecting, they're expecting us to be the experts in that. Even if we're not sustainability consultants, you know, whether you're an architect or an interior architect or designer, they're expecting you to know at all of the things and what they should be considering. And so I think, um, you know, coming to people with those ideas and maybe, you know, not presenting them as things that are big, different budget buster type ideas, but slipping things in where you can, making an impact in some of the bigger areas that you know are going to meet their goals. And also right now, I think we're in a moment where we're feeling the urgency, not just around climate change, but around health and wellness. And like, let's, let's, go with that. Let's run with that. Like now every single project on day one also should be talking about health and wellness in their space. And that's something that, you know, of all the terrible things that we've all been through this year, like that's something that I really hope will, will carry us forward to that. It's not just about climate change, but it's also, um, you know, it's both and it's health and wellness, it's equity. It's all of these things that we've, <laughs> we've all been experiencing this year and, and making sure that we're talking about those things upfront. Thank, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so the next question is, um, sustainability can mistakenly be seen as a trade-off, pushed to the uh, pursued at the expense of goals such as equity, well-being, culture, or cost savings. So how can designers overcome and architects overcome the misconception that sustainability is a trade-off? We can start with Mark. Thanks. Um, Yes, uh, it is. Um, not every client is is ready to think about sustainability alternatives, um, and very often, as a sort of baseline, um, you know, the the conventional way of just delivering a project. It's the most expedient. It's tried and true. All the consultants know what to do. Um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time designing or, or reinventing the wheel when we know what what we're trying to do. So, if you take that as a sort of, of baseline, the conventional way, um, you know, then, then from, from that, you're able to, to move forward. So the, the idea of um, you know, meeting clients where they are, which has been said a couple times already, if, if you're already very progressive and you want to be even more progressive, or if you're only, let's say, doing lead because it's a funding requirement and you really don't care, you just need to get it done, you know, and, and everything in between, the idea is that you've always got this sort of vector where you're trying to move people towards you know, greater levels of, of sustainability. So to get somebody to say there's not a trade-off really has to do with a mindset that you establish up front. And the way you do that is, is by sort of a, a goal setting facilitation where you're able to uh, establish appropriate sustainability goals that everybody agrees on. So if you're able to do a project properly, you get everybody together and, and do a, a goal setting workshop or a charrette where you're able to take a look at the larger ideas and, and really determine the values that the project wants to achieve. And if you're able to establish consensus among the values, then what you're trying to do is determine a roadmap by which to get there. That's the way you avoid the trap of having the client say, well, wait a minute, it, why are we doing this? It costs more. If we're able to establish that the, the vision of this project is where everybody wants to go, then you're able to move everything and mobilize all forces towards it. We, we've encountered this on, on projects the, that are uh, living buildings, uh, that are, are net zero projects, very challenging with a lot of coordination. So it's, it's difficult to say, okay, we're going to create a building that's generating more energy than it uses. But the, the beautiful thing about it is when there is that alignment around that goal, you suddenly aren't wasting time on trying to figure out how to substitute or, or work around or cut corners or do something cheaper because you know right away that the answer is going to be no. You have to go towards that particular goal, as, as difficult as that might be. So there's a lot of sort of um, alignment, which is very beneficial. So you know the 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 uh, the the way around this, then uh, the 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 way to not have sustainability seen as something additional or extra or an extra hassle, 
is, is to come up with a project goal that is so precise and, and, and so well established that that's what everybody's working towards. Thank you. Uh, Angelica, any comments? Um, I, I actually really agree with Mark here um, about the, the goal setting. I think that that's absolutely critical. Of course, I kind of already uh, hit on that a bit because I think it's just so important because we're not just talking about, you know, if we do this, then this. There's also all of these other, you know, either co-benefits or um, you know, on the bad side of things that can happen when you make these certain type of decisions. And so it's really important to understand how that affects the entire ecosystem of a project. Like one decision on, you know, for example, the, the lighting that's used or something can have all of these impacts down the line. And so I think it's really important to, to figure out what those priorities are and be measuring everything against those. Um, and I also like, I don't see those things as a trade off. I can see how some, how some projects might think of it that way. But I think, you know, our approach to sustainability is this comprehensive look at, at everything from environmental impact to health impact to equity impact. You know, I see cultures listed in, in this question as well and cost savings, right? It's about, we need the, the organization to be financially sustainable. So all of these things, I think, you know, live under the umbrella of sustainability and of these, these kind of core tenets of projects that make them have soul and make them really meaningful to both the organizations, you know, that are owning them or occupying them and also the community um, that they're within. Kim, do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, when I hear trade-off, I, I think about, am I sacrificing one thing for something else? And when I think about interior finishes, I speak for myself at Shaw, I speak for my friends at Herman Miller, at Steelcase, at Meco, Construction Specialties. I don't think there's any trade-offs. Right? I'm part of an a, a group of manufacturers that we heard you, design community, say, hey, we want to see cradle to cradle. We want to see material transparency. We want to see EPDs. We've got them. Right, so we wrote a letter out to the uh, A and D community and saying, "Hey, we've done this." And between these forty-five manufacturers, uh, Ashley, I think we have three thousand HPDs. Right, we have six hundred and forty-eight products that are cradle to cradle certified. It's there; it doesn't cost anymore. But I think we have to stop maybe thinking about this. And and Brenna, Brenna you you talked about it in the beginning. If you make it about people, people will respond differently. Like we're selecting it in IIDA and NEWH, we're selecting interior finishes. And I think we have conversations with clients to say that cl clean air is, is not a privilege, it's a right. Right? Chemicals of concern, we do not want the, we, we don't want these in our products. In our, you wouldn't want them in your house. Why would you want them in your workplace? Right? The, the most important component, the most expensive component of every building that you design for are people, employees, doctors, patients, students, right? How do we start to focus the design story about that most important component? And I think that through the tools that we've developed, through interior finishes, like Cradle to Cradle and, and Declare and HPDs and EPDs, it gives us the ability to tell different stories on the choices that we make. And it gives us different stories to tie that back to that most important component, which are the people in these spaces. So that's where we're at today. I mean, I remember early on where recycled content actually cost more. Customers had to pay more for recycled content. So I'm showing my age right now, but for those younger designers, hard pressed to find anything that you specify today that doesn't have recycled content. That happened because we changed the way that we communicated, we changed the way we manufactured, now it's just the norm, right? You think about chemical avoidance, the elimination of PFAS, which is dear to me in Ohio and Pittsburgh and West Virginia. We have industries that have eliminated these. My, my friends in furniture, eliminating halogenated flame retardants. We need to take pride in this and, and educate that these are better interior finishes for the people we design for. And it doesn't cost anymore. 
But again, talk about air, talk about productivity, talk about, you know, cognitive decision making, absenteeism, presenteeism. Um, so I don't think there's any trade offs when it comes to interior finishes anymore. Um, and we need to be careful of that. Right. My friend Robin Bass from Google says, uh, you know, the last thing we want to do is to, is to go out and specify some carbon neutral lead paint. Right. That's a trade off. So how do we look at things holistically, Put, putting people first? And again, it comes with that opportunity of, you know, in my personal life or maybe in your personal life, you might look at labels and think about how that's going to affect your life, your family's life. Um, what, are the, what, what kind of car do you drive or choose not to drive? And I hope that we all do that. You signed up for this, so, so I hope you do. But you think about the scale of what we do professionally and the scale of square footage. If we can translate those personal values into our professional lives, that's where we create this massive change. And that's where we need to continue to challenge ourselves with this starting line and continue to move forward. So in interior finishes, I, I honestly don't believe that we have to make those trade-offs any longer. We just have to change the way we communicate. We as manufacturers to you design professionals and hopefully together to, to the owners of the spaces that we design for. Thank you. Brenna, do you have anything for us? Yeah, I think uh, you know a lot of things that have already been said um, really resonated with with me and my understanding of of um, of this. I think that you know, it, I think the trade offs happen um, in certain places. You know, if there's a trade off between sustainability and equity, that's not a truly sustainable project. Mm -hmm. If there's a trade off between sustainability and well being, uh, human health, that's not a truly sustainable project. I think we have to broaden our idea of what the definition of sustainability should be and what it can be. Um, it's not just about having a high performing building. It's about having a high performing building that supports the goals and aspirations of all of the residents and or all of the all of the occupants and optimizes their ability to lead healthy, happy lives. It's about supporting the community in a way um, that fosters equity. It's about environmental justice um, at large. It's about all of these things. Um, that, you know, I think that oftentimes the building industry can be very narrow with our definition of what sustainability is. And I think that's, um, not to get too uh, soapboxy here, but the, the ego of the architect and the ego of the designer and the inability to look outside of our profession uh, to other areas of expertise, I think is a real failure. Um, and that's why one of the things that we really try and focus on at our firm is a transdisciplinary approach where we're looking to the life sciences, we're looking to physics, we're looking to technology, we're looking to all of these advancements that are happening in all of these industries that typically would be considered unrelated to architecture and design. But we absolutely have to be learning from one, one another at this point. We're at a, a critical point. Uh, our, our planet, our, the human, you know, humanity is at a critical point right now. Um, and the idea that architecture is evolving in this bubble um, where we think of sustainability as achieving a rating system, or we think of sustainability as, you know, ch checking a box. Um, you know, I think, that, I think that's a really scary approach because, uh, you know, like Tim was saying, it doesn't speak to that holistic nature of what sustainability has the potential to be. Um, so I'm really excited about the idea that this could be something expansive where architects have the opportunity to dialogue in a much clearer way with all of these other industries and our clients. Um, I think that, you know, going back to the, uh, the ego of the architect and that's just because I am one, but you know, designers in general, um, the, the language we use really, I think, um, I really think that the language we use does, a, does the profession a disservice. And I think that it leads to the idea that trade-offs are absolutely necessary. Um, the, the high barrier to entry uh, to learning and incorporating some of these things is just is astronomical. When you have a client who's going to build one building over their lifetime and you go in talking about all of these really complex mechanical systems, um, all of these different renewables, that the language and the learning curve is just too high. I feel like we need to do a better job of what others were saying, storytelling, communicating, listening. Um, and, you know, setting that common trajectory in a language that everyone can understand. 
Um, and so, you know, absolutely, I think that it is a mistake that uh, sustainability is seen is trading off with all of these other things when it really needs to be embracing them and uh, moving forward in a really much bigger way. Thank you. All right, we're on to our next question. And again, I'm, I'm going to start with Brenna again, just because you haven't had a chance to start our conversation. But um, this goes along with what you've already said, but um, in a way, but you can add on to this. What sustainable processes should be prioritized? Small changes might be the only ones some can or will make right now. Keeping that in mind, what are some things they can do to stay within reason? Um, yeah, I think, you know, keep, keep it simple, stupid, right? Like, I think that it is absolutely critical that we, we start by looking at passive strategies. Um, I feel like way too often some, somebody will come, a client or a developer will come and say, um, you know, we, we have this piece of land, we need to maximize it, we need to build to the maximum FAR, we need to build to all of our setbacks. Um, and then you're boxed in. You have absolutely no opportunity to incorporate any of those passive strategies from the outset because you have no ability to shape that massing. And then it's additive, right? Then you have a really highly inefficient building on a site that's that's not ideal, you know, it's not ideally oriented on the site. It doesn't take into consideration the microclimate, none of these things. And you just keep adding PV to overcome all of these inefficiencies that you've created for yourself um, by not taking advantages of all of the different uh, site elements that are right there. Um, so, you know, keeping this short, I absolutely think that every single, uh, for me, architectural project, every building, every master plan um, should start by looking at those, you know, those passive systems, um, those things that are not additive. And I like to think of them as elegant solutions, um, the ones that are very simple and straightforward and uh, give you the most bang for your buck. Angelica? Um, so I, you know, one thing I was thinking a lot about this question, because I'm like, what can we tell people to do right now? And I would say, you know, right now, everyone should be taking this moment to, to take a look at you know, if you're starting something with a client or if you're an owner yourself or a developer yourself, start thinking about kind of what is your baseline? Like, where are you right now? And do you understand, you know, like how much energy your building is using or water your building is using? But maybe even, even more importantly and more simply, like who cleans your office and what does that what does that look like? Or who cleans your, you know, your spaces or how are you purchasing you know, paper for your space. I mean, there's just so many things on this operational side. And I think that often that gets lost because it's the, it's kind of the least exciting part of a project or the, the operational phase, but it's something that I think as, as designers as well, it's a very important component for you to be thinking about. And I think someone already said this about what is it going to look like to operate this space and to, to occupy it. And how can we design for that? And then, you know, when you're on the other side of things, like just really thinking about, you know, the basics, like right now, you know, we're having a lot of conversations with clients about rating systems related to COVID and to, you know, viral pre prevention, whether it's the well health safety rating or the, the fit well viral response module. And, and I think that those are good places to start too, because they're looking at things like policies, emergency preparedness, you know, what is, what is your policy on for HR and sick days? Like it starts to really broaden this um, perspective of what you should be thinking about in order to make the most impact. Because, you know, I think that there's a lot of solutions that are, um, you know, maybe what people would consider to be more innovative or more exciting, but ultimately how often are you changing your filters or how much outdoor air are you bringing into your space? Like there's some real kind of not exciting things that I think now is the time to really be, be taking a look at those. Thank you. Tim? So how do you, pro how do you prioritize sustainability, interior finishes? And in this conversation, I think we've identified a bunch of different challenges that we have in front of us, right? As a society, right? Social responsibility, climate change, 
circular economy and recycling. We haven't talked about that yet. Material health, chemistry, chemicals of concern. That's a lot to address, right? I make products. You design buildings using the price we make. How do you address all of these things all at once? If you try to do it all at once, we're going to be in this webinar next year, the year after that, the year after that. So my advice is that what I've seen uh, leaders like Perkins and Will or HKS, um, uh, NBBJ, Google, Harvard, uh, to quote Jay-Z, you got a million ways to get it, choose one, right? Start with one, right? Start with one interior finish. Like we are gonna get really good as a firm and go through our library and prioritize social and climate and health and indoor air quality around flooring. And when we get really good at that, we're gonna to move to furniture. When we get really good at that, we're gonna to move to paint. And if you can get really, really good, each kind of you know section of, of, of the selections you make one at a time, it's gonna add up. For example, NBBJ, uh, uh, every quarter identifies a chemical of concern that they wanna eliminate. So maybe Q1 is halogenated flame retardants. And the architects and the designers start asking manufacturers, do you have this in your product? Then they all report back, right? So I would say if we try, if you try to look at every finish you do on your next project, it's gonna be frustrating. But if you can get really, really good one finish at a time, I think that's gonna add up and you're gonna get better each time you move on. So find out what your priorities are. And as it's been mentioned several times, work with your client where they're at. I would challenge you to work with your manufacturers where they're at, right? Start with, with segment by segment. And I think you're gonna be surprised that a lot of these manufacturers are gonna be really excited to get into these conversations with you. So uh, that's my advice. Start one at a time, get really, really good at this a little bit at a time. These are all great answers. I love the variety. Mark, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, just, just a little bit. Um, but most of uh, what I was going to say is, has been addressed very well. But, um, you know, if, if you're looking to have the most bang for the buck, um, you know, some of the truisms that we've just discussed, uh, you know, um, uh, start with the passive first. You know, if, if you think that uh, our ancestors uh, built cities and buildings for you know, 9,000 years without air conditioning, you know, so, you know, work with the site, which means look to nature for guidance, which means observe prevalent wind patterns, sun patterns, uh, uh, the hydrology of the site, uh, how, you know, uh, how the, uh, um, how the patterns are, what, what the biophilic pattern or uh, biological patterns are. So if you, if you work with that, start passive first, then already you can make your way towards a lot of uh, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the concept of daylight autonomy means how much of the time can your building operate without using electrical lighting? Well, then that means you have windows and you have skylights and you're letting the, the light come in without needing to use electricity. Uh, if you have ventilation autonomy, that means that you've got the ability to have enough air going through your space that you're comfortable without needing fan power to, to power it through. So if you can take a look at these passive systems and try to, to design for just those two things, for instance, you, you can actually you know, get, a, get a, lot of the, a lot of the way there. Um, the other way to look at it is that of all the different components of a building, and they kind of go from the outside in, you have the, the building shell, the envelope, then you have your mechanical systems, then you have you know, your doors and windows and so forth, then you have your finishes and flooring, and then you have your furniture. Um, those, each of those things have a, has a smaller and smaller horizon where uh, you, know, you might have a desktop technology that ages out in three years. And you have a might have a workstation um, and, and cubicle setup that uglies out in seven years, and you might have an HVAC system that becomes uh, um, uh, inefficient in 15 years, and then and then you work your way out, and you've got yourself your building envelope, which might very well last 100 years or 150 years. So, in other words, the the very technical active things are are very. Have have ten tend to have short life cycles, and then the the very passive things, the structure, 
has a much longer horizon, which is why when you're trying to come up with what's the best bang for the buck, figure out how to site your building appropriately, what massing east and west a ratio, and there's no right answer, by the way, because it depends on your climate and it depends on your site. But if you can evaluate those things, and that's really a key that we haven't talked a whole lot about just yet, uh, the simulation of alternatives and, and the ability to right size and optimize different systems, then you can actually make really solid decisions very early. And that's one thing about the uh, integrated design process is that uh, you want to try to short um, uh, forward charge your decision making so that you make the right, you're asking the right questions and making the right decisions as early as possible. Thank you. So much. I think what we're going to do in the interest of time is we're going to do one more question from my list here. And then we have a couple of questions from the Q&A that we can finish up with. Um, so the next question is, what will support and grow the community to answer these questions and even ask more? We know that this topic requires more expertise um, that extends way beyond any single domain. So where should we be looking? Tim, I'll start with you. I'd say look first within yourself. What problems do you want to solve every day? Right? As a design professional, again, how do you translate those personal values into your professional life? And it seems if you if you think about sustainability in the A and D community and manufacturers, it seems like we were just talking to ourselves. Like we had this tribe we were a part of, and Google was doing this, and Kaiser was doing this. It was a San Francisco thing, but that circle got bigger. The circle got bigger because I think a lot of people started to get on board because they asked themselves, "What problems do they want to do they want to solve in their professional lives?" Is it chemicals of concern? You know, ask yourself this question as a design professional. How could you design a hospital with no carcinogens? Or how could you design a school with no reproductive toxicity? How can the design decisions that you make today create better water quality for those that are in compromising positions? How can you make design decisions that might give us a longer runway or reverse climate change as we know it? And if you had that opportunity, would you do it? Ask yourself that question first, all right? So then where do we go, all right? So we've created all these different tools. I think one place we go, Mark, and I hope you hit on this, is the AIA 2030 challenge, right? AIA and IIDA and NEWH traditionally never have been maybe on the same page, right? We're in the same building, you're in the same office, but there's this new material pledge and I think it's the first time that I've seen AIA create this pledge that guess what? Interior design, you are in, right? You're all in on this. And it's to make design decisions that support uh, climate health, ecosystem health, social uh, responsibility, climate change, material health, right? Go to that AIA 2030 challenge. That'll help you solve a lot of those questions that you're asking yourself. And then we have these tools called cradle to cradle and HPD and declare. And the last thing you need is more certifications, right? It seems like the products that we are delivering to you uh, start to look like the arm of, it, of an NBA player. They're just covered in all these different, you know, labels. <laughs> so the one place that I would go, and I'm biased because I'm a part of this, is a program called Mindful Materials. Mindful Materials started out as a sticker program at HKS in Dallas. And then it became a website. But what it's becoming is a movement. And it's a movement that is, uh, it's not a tool as much as an instrument that we are all playing together. And it changes the way that we can communicate about our products as we talk to you about them as design professionals. It gives you one place to go to find out. It doesn't say that my product's better than another product but it gives you the opportunity to look at the work that manufacturers do. And it's really simplifying the selection process and it's simplifying that one place to go for all of us to go. So I'd encourage all of you as a firm to make a commitment to the AIA materials pledge, but also make a commitment to say that as a design strategy, we're gonna make our selections with manufacturers that are willing to tell us more about who they are and what they make we want to see your products loaded in mindful materials. 
Mindful Material started out as a library program. It's used in 14 countries today, 13,000 products and about 10,000 design professionals. The only way to continue to grow this is to get more people into that circle. So ask yourself, what problems do you want to solve? Look at that through the choices you make and design decisions. And I think you can simplify that by becoming part of this mindful materials community and part of this movement. Mark, I'll let you jump in. Um, thanks. Um, yes, we can't do this by ourselves. And I, I think, um, you know, if, if, if we're going to pick on the architecture field a little bit, it's this sort of mentality of the architect being the one who knows everything, like Frank Lloyd Wright, probably our, our nation's you know, most celebrated architect, always being right and never admitting fault and that, that kind of thing. Um, we've really managed to move away from that um, to where it's not just one genius who's coming up with all this, but rather a multidisciplinary group of, 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 of talented folks, each with their own disciplines. We talked about the integrated design process just a bit. That's part of the fun of it is that you bring the team members into this integrated design process. So it's not just the architect and the owner, but you've also got you know, the civil engineer and the interior designer and the operator and, and uh, you know, uh, energy modeler and so forth. And if the more you can bring people in to these um, initial discussions, the, the more lively the discussion becomes because you know, sometimes you'll find that the best answer about a certain question comes from uh, a discipline, landscape architect or something that you wouldn't have imagined. And so that's really the benefit of this is having this sort of um, uh, um, you know, multi-headed type of group think where everybody's able to bring their expertise in and you leave the egos out because after all it's all about solving problems it's all about trying to get consensus so you know the, this notion of of being uh multidisciplinary i think is extremely powerful uh like like brianna was saying uh, you know our own office as well you know we have sociology we have physics we have uh, systems thinking and, and you know at the end of the day it's really systems thinking that's required in order to try to, to come up with these solutions because it, it's not just a two-dimensional type of movement, it's also three-dimensional and time-bound as well. So the more you can uh, think of it in, in those, those ways, the more you're able to look at what different uh, experts can, can, can bring to, to the question. So like, um, you know, it reminds me of a quote, if, if you're having trouble um, solving the problem, uh, enlarge the problem, uh, you know, make the problem even bigger, and then you might have more tools with which to address it. Um, as we're dealing with things now, the problems have also become more elaborate, where in the, for instance, in the early 1970s, when um, uh, the Arab oil embargo was the real problem, and oh my God, we, we, we've got a ration energy now, and, and so we started making our buildings super tight in order to be as energy efficient as possible which then led to a host of uh, uh, problems called sick building syndrome. You know, people were sentenced to spend 40 hour work weeks inside of these toxic silos called buildings. And so this is an example of trying to solve one problem without looking at the ramifications. Now in 2020, it's not just about energy efficiency, it's about carbon and climate change. It's about social equity and diversity and opportunity. It's also about health and wellness and productivity and trying to reduce toxic materials. It's also about COVID readiness and, and social distancing and things like that. So you get the idea that these simple little problems are super complex because they actually engage many different dynamics. So you know the, the uh, key here is to choose a group of experts and have everybody working together on the same problems. And that's how you can get uh, you know, the types of solutions that are able to, to last. Because if you're solving one problem with one set of solutions, um, the example that Brianna gave before about if, you're, or if, you're, if your building needs to be outgrown in five years, you haven't solved the problem. Same thing here. If you're solving a problem one way, you're not maybe seeing these other problems that are also just as important that you just happen to have not defined that's a failure. So the more you can enlarge your circle of experts, the more effective your solution is going to be, the more durable your solution is going to be. Thank you, Mark. Angelica? 
Um, I think, I mean, I think probably the, the most important thing is to have more conversations like this, right? I mean, it's, it's great that um, bringing together people from different disciplines to, to talk. And I know that there's a lot right now, actually, of like free webinar content. I don't know who has been participating in that. I certainly have been. Um, it's right now, there's just so many events and, and virtual, you know, virtual events and webinars that are available and content that's available for free. So I guess like the first thing I would say is just like take the time to, to educate yourself, to understand better some of the things that you're curious about. I mean, I think I probably, you know, speak for a lot of us when I say like some of these big questions a lot of it is just research on our part to try to figure out, you know, so some of those things, anticipating what those questions are, really staying ahead with continuing education. I think that that's very important. Um, but I also think that it's, it's about asking questions and speaking up, you know, I mean, no matter where you are within a project, um, you know, even if you think that you're an insignificant part of it, those types of, of important questions or just speaking up and saying, I think we could do this a better way um, rather than just kind of doing it the way that everybody else is already planning to do. I mean, there's certainly a time and a place for those conversations, obviously I'm not recommending we all call each other out constantly. However, I do think that, you know, we need to foster a culture within project teams too where these questions are not only, you know, welcomed, but expected. Like we need to start challenging each other um, more uh, about, you know, kind of the approaches that we're taking. And I also think that in terms of working with, with clients specifically, um, and I think, I think Brenna may have mentioned this already, but it's about the language that we use. Um, you know, as we, as we develop our expertise in this, these areas, making sure that our language is still really accessible. Because, you know, I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of, you know, what's happening in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Um, but what about the rest of the state? <laughs> you know, like, for example, just talking about Pennsylvania, there's a lot of projects happening that are not in these city centers. And if we really want to enact large scale transformational change, we can't forget about everybody else that's kind of, you know, in the middle there. Great, thank you. Brenna? Yeah, I thought of, um, of all of the questions I thought that this one was was really important, particularly the second half of the first question, and it was to, to about asking more questions. Um, and to add on to that, I think it's also about asking better questions, and also constantly being self aware enough to recognize when the questions we have been asking are wrong, and um, being able to continue to grow in that way. You know, it's it is about education. I think one of the things that can be really challenging is you set yourself on this path of education of you know your career and you always should be testing that against um, not just what you know but what you think needs to be done um, so i think that's the first thing is just always making sure that we're problem setting not just problem solving those things that are immediately in front of us um, i think that's one way to really um, help to foster creativity and innovation in our industry that's um, historically really slow to innovate um, and is uh, oftentimes at risk of being left very far behind. Um, and then the other thing I would say about, you know, trying to, to grow community to um, and requiring expertise that ex extends beyond any single domain. Um, this is hugely important. It's, and it's hugely complex. I think um, I was thinking about this when, when Mark was talking about all of the different experts that you would wanna have at the table. It's overwhelming. It's absolutely overwhelming. And so, you know, I think that it's that idea of allowing yourself to be where you are and to continue to your growth from that point um, in a way that interests you. And so, you know, I think it's okay to be weird in that way. Um, if, if somebody is in your, you know, if the profession is generally really interested in um, renewable energy, but that just doesn't work for you, focus on what it is that you can uniquely bring to this conversation. Um, and I think that's a way to also uh, innovate. I think innovation is hugely important right now um, across architecture and uh, making sure that we're drawing from other industries. Um, so yeah, I you know allow yourself to be kind of true to that self, true to that interest. That's the only way that 
your interest in sustainability will be sustainable is if you're actually legitimately interested in it and see the value. And so you have to start with that first step that commits you to it, that gets you hooked on it, um, that makes it a really important integral part of your life. So, um, so start where you're interested. Really great. Thanks for the advice, everybody. I think we're gonna finish up with one more question and that's gonna come from our Q&A, uh, which is, how can we exceed sustainability and co-create generative places? Angelica, do you want to start? That's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I got this one first, just kidding. Um, you know, I, I think my initial reaction to this question is that we, by by thinking about things as kind of like black and white of either we're, you know, creating regenerative places or we're doing, it's hard to actually define what that means, I guess, is my first, <laughs> my first thing is I, I think that it's, a, it's really important to be considering all of these different things that we've been talking about, you know, whether it's um, environmental impact or health impact or social equity impact. Um, there, there's just a lot to consider. And again, I think it goes back to setting what those objectives are at the beginning of the project, being very clear with everybody about that. And also, you know, inviting new people to the table. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about who should be at that table, but, you know, the other piece of it too is the community, right? And so any, any development project is not just kind of happening in isolation. So trying to understand local context who is the community that you're serving? You know, I think that that co-creation piece is really important to not just have the ownership of the space, you know, from kind of the, the one client person, but really the community of people that is going to interact with that space in some way. And so I think, you know, you could, we could talk about all the different certifications and ratings and frameworks that a project might use, but it's really about making sure that you're hitting those targets um, that are related really to the place that you're in. I think that that's a, a critical component of, of, of actually approaching a project like that. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up. Anybody else have any comments about that question? Can you repeat that question one time, please? Certainly. How can we exceed sustainability and co-create regenerative places? I think if we started to design like we were indigenous to this place, that'd be a good starting line. And can we start to think about the decisions that we make and the impacts today and tomorrow? I think a gap that we have and, and an opportunity that we have is can we start designing for circular economies, right? How do we design for disassembly? How do we design materials that can be uh, disassembled, recycled back into themselves over and over again. How do we design buildings to do that and then create systems to do it? I think that, and first of all, I'll, I'll apologize to the, to the design community. I think that you have been over-promised and under-delivered when it comes to circular economy. You've heard the word take back. You've heard this is recyclable. You've heard it too much and the follow-through hasn't been there. So I think we need to get serious about, and by the way, there's some really good projects in Pittsburgh that are happening around circular economy and recycling of materials, um, thanks to my local team. But I think as, a, how can we do this? We, as, as, as design leaders and as architects and as owners and even manufacturers, we have got to stop only thinking about recycling at the point of disposal. We can't fix problems at the end of the pipe. We have got to start thinking about circular economy with how we specify. Can we start to specify to create opportunities for circularity in the future? If not, I think we're gonna be stuck. So I think that would be my advice is how do we start designing for circular economies? And looking at buildings as raw material banks instead of pulling natural resources out of this planet. Anyone else? For, for that particular question, I, I would add in, um, you know, the, the necessity of, of not just problem solving, but problem seeking, because um, 
when you're looking at trying to become regenerative, which is a step above net zero, the, the idea is that the systems are all giving back. Um, you're generating more energy than you're using. The water coming out is cleaner than the water going in. And, and, and uh, it, it, it's such a positive environment that everybody is, is refreshed and replenished. You really have to think in terms of the systems and not just the bricks and mortar of the building, but how each of the parts of that, whether it's the design of it, whether it's the construction of it, whether it's the operation of it, how all of those systems are actually able to um, uh, touch other systems. You know, for instance, if if you know your your project is you know, you know is going to have a, a cafe or something like that or a, 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 a coffee bar, you know, maybe it's not just a question of buying a coffee machine and getting a barista. Maybe it's a question of of uh, having that be an opportunity for training and engagement for you know, uh, you know disenfranchised people in the community, or you know, I mean, th those are the types of thinkings that you have to do. So when you look at that, it's way more than just bricks and mortar of a building. It's actually all the energies that go in and out of the building, the metabolism of the electricity and the gas that goes in, and the and the waste and the exhaust that comes out, the people who come in, the people who go out, the ideas that go in, the you know, services that go out, all of those things together are how you have to conceive of a project that's going to be regenerative. I think I'm all in last year, so I'll, uh, I'll just kind of tack on a few things. Um, I think it's about trying to build wisely, surrounding yourself with the right people who have the right expertise, getting all of the right people in the room is the hardest part. Uh, making sure that all of, uh, all of the voices are heard, all of the experts are there, um, and that you're, you know, you're all collectively heading in the right direction. So I think building wisely and um, not to talk myself out of a job, but building lightly and building less. Um, you know, the, the most sustainable building is the one that you don't build. Um, so, you know, I think that trying to move away from the word smart, um, <laughs> uh, trying to build wisely, uh, trying to build um, sensitively, um, trying to build in a way that is looking, uh, you know, like others were saying, not just at the, at the bottom line, but at the triple bottom line. And so, um, yeah, I think that, you know, that's the best we can do is, is um, build lightly unfortunately for me. I'm muted. <laughs> actually, I actually have a question. I didn't type it into the chat, but I have a question if we can um, get an answer for um, coming from NEWH from the hospitality side. Um, hospitality tends to be one of the last um, sectors to be really in, engaged in this. And um, I was just wondering if any of you have any success stories, um, if we do have any NEWH members on here that can, can give us some ideas of how to get this implemented more in this type of design. Um, I mean, I know it's very important just right up there with healthcare with the, the occupants human health, um, but unfortunately it hasn't been embraced as much as some of the other communities. It's something that I've been working on for the past couple of years. Listen, I've not been working on, I've been working with people that are really, really smart. And, and what was your name that asked the question? This is Heather, actually. <laughs> oh, hey, Heather. Yeah. So, so hospitality, right? So you think of corporate America, you think of education, they are building to well, building to lead, they're, they're putting uh, material health into their product standards, but we have not seen that in hospitality. I agree. Um, so there's a program that Marriott built called uh, MindClick. And it is a way to keep a score of a, of, a, of, a, of a hotel out of 200 points based on the interior finishes that are selected and each product that goes into that facility gets a score. So it scores out and it takes just data from the work that that manufacturer has done through cradle to cradle or HPD, carbon neutral manufacturing, social responsibility, and it gives every product a score. And you could score, you know, say 140 out of 200, that would be a mind click 
design for health leader, or it could come in as an achiever. It could come in as a beginner. So it's really simplifying uh, the selection process for design professionals to select products that are part of MindClick. But then what Marriott did is they started to use MindClick on how they promoted the renovations in their hotels. So they had uh, some Marriott courtyards that uh, were specified using materials that achieved like a Marriott courtyard MindClick leader, right? A hundred and call it 160 make them out of 200, but started to put signage in, in uh, you know, healthy materials, uh, better sleep, those type of things. They marketed that in, in, in the hotel. And those three Marriott courtyards got the highest NSP, net promoter score, of any Marriott courtyard in the United States. And they tied it back to people. They tied it back to the interior finishes. And they tied it back to you know, that brand of sustainability. So this program called MindClick, I would encourage all of you to uh, take a dive into that because it's not just a Marriott thing anymore. MindClick is, is its own entity. And I think a lot of other hospitality FF&E companies and uh, hospitality end users are starting to look at that as a tool to get their built environments into this space around uh, interiors and, and sustainability. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Well, I think that was a really great place to wrap up, Heather. Thank you for that question. And thank all of you for joining us. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors, Next Architecture and Franklin Interiors sponsored this webinar. So thank you so much. And uh, be on the lookout because this is a recorded webinar. So we'll be sharing this. You can share it with your friends, family, coworkers after this. And thanks again, you guys. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.